Hi, my name is Costanza Larese, and in this video I shall provide a short introduction to death-bounded logics. First of all, I shall briefly present myself and my research interests. In 2019, I received my PhD in philosophy at Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, Italy, with Professor Massimo Mugnai and Professor Marcello D'Agostino as supervisors. In my work, I studied the principle of analyticity of logic, proposing both a historical philosophical reconstruction of the principle and a logical characterization of the analytic synthetic distinction. Since 2021, I am postdoc researcher at the Logic Group in the Department of Philosophy at the University La Statale in Milan, Italy. Here, I work mainly with Professor Marcello D'Agostino, and my research project focuses on extending death-bounded Boolean logics to the first-order case, and we have already published a paper with the first results, and on extending these logics to the epistemic and non-monotonic logics. So, my research interests include classical and non-classical logics. In particular, I study death-bounded logics, epistemic and non-monotonic logics, and, I might say, theories of bounded rationality in general. But I am also interested in the history and philosophy of logic. In my PhD thesis, for example, I have examined the conception of logic and the analytic synthetic distinction in several prominent authors such as Leibniz, Kant, Bolzano, Frege and Intica. Last, I have a minor interest in the history of mathematics, both modern and contemporary. So, uh, this presentation of death-bounded Boolean logics shall be organized as follows. First, I shall explain the philosophical motivation and roots of these logics, which are essential, I think, to understand them properly. Second, I shall present the main features of death-bounded Boolean logics, which are propositional logics. And third, I shall introduce the fundamental idea behind the extension of death-bounded Boolean logics to the first-order case. So, let's start with the philosophical motivations, and we might say that death-bounded logic, logics might be seen as a reaction against the principle of analyticity and tautologicity of logic. But what does this principle say? Well, as it is well known, the term analytic has assumed a variety of meanings throughout its history, and it is clear that the same goes also for the term logic itself. But I think that it is fair to say that, especially in the first half of the 20th century, the idea that logic is analytic consisted in the claim that logical inferences are valid solely by virtue of the meaning of the logical operators and can be recognized as such by pure conceptual analysis. And this idea found its most fertile ground in the philosophical position known as logical empiricism, and here you can see some of the most significant figures of the Vienna Circle, Moritz Schlicht, Otto Neurath and Hans Hahn. And since then, the principle of analyticity of logic caught on and became part of the logical folklore. However, according to the logical empiricist movement, logic is not only analytic, it is also tautological, and this means that the information carried by the conclusion of a logical inference is already contained, albeit implicitly, in its premises. In this way, Logic is assumed to be devoid of any informational content. Logic is, in one word, trivial. However, the idea that logic is analytic and tautological raises several problems. First of all, it is highly counterintuitive. Imagine a long deductive chain. Its conclusion might appear as an actual novelty with respect to its premises. Similarly, imagine a particularly complex sentence. The recognition that that sentence is a tautology might appear as a true discovery. And Jaco Intica described this situation 
as a true scandal of deduction in his book Logic, Language Games and Information. Moreover, in 1935-1936, we learned, as a result of independent investigation of Turing and Church, that the logic of quantification, that is, first order logic, is undecidable. And this means that there is no mechanical procedure that allows us to answer yes or no to all questions of the form is phi a logical consequence of psi 1 psi n when psi 1 psi n are sentences of a fixed quantificational language containing at least one non-monadic predicate, such as, for example, a binary relation. Third, although it is decidable, Propositional logic, that is, Boolean logic, is most probably intractable. That is to say, it is not decidable in practice. And this amounts to say that any real agent, even if equipped with an up-to-date computer running a decision procedure for Boolean logic, may never be able to feasibly recognize the certain Boolean sentence fo logically follow from sentences that the agent regards as true. So the point is, if first order logic is undecidable and the decision problem for Boolean logic is most probably intractable, how is it possible to maintain that classical logic is an informative, trivial, analytic? Well, this observation is at the origin of the approach of death-bounded Boolean logics, which has been put forward by D'Agostino and co-authors in a series of papers published in the last 12 years or so. This approach finds an essential difference, which is not captured by classical logic, between these two kinds of inferences. On the one hand, the inference from the premise P or Q, if Q then R and not P, to the conclusion R. On the other hand, the inference from the premises P or Q, or and if P then Q, to the conclusion Q. Well, the argument to establish the soundness of the first inference is the following. From premises 1 and 3, we might infer that Q is the case, and then from Q together with premise 2, we conclude that R. Here, at each step, we are using information that we actually possess, information that are contained in the premises. On the other hand, a typical argument for the second example would run as follows. Given the two premises, we first suppose that P is the case, and from this hypothesis, together with premise 2, we might conclude that Q. Then, we suppose that not P is the case, and from this hypothesis, together with premise 1, we might conclude that Q. Then, Q must be true, because Q can be concluded in both cases. So, in this latter example, we make essential use of information that we do not actually possess, and is not even implicitly contained in the information we actually possess. This is what we call virtual information. That is, information that we do not actually possess, but we must temporarily assume in order to reach the conclusion. So, death-bounded Boolean logics are an infinite hierarchy of logics that approximates Boolean logic and represents increasing levels of synthetic or informativeness. So, logic zero, which is the basic element of this hierarchy, validates only analytic inferences. Analytic inferences are the, those inferences whose conclusions can be established in terms of the actual information that is implicitly contained in the premises, according to a weaker and informational explanation of the logical operators. Then, for every k greater than zero, logic k validates only synthetic inferences of depth k, namely inferences in which at most k nested pieces of virtual information are needed to obtain the conclusion from the premises. So the greater k, the more informative the logic is. And crucially, the problem of establishing whether or not a sentence follows from a given set of premises 
by means of a k-depth synthetic inference is a tractable problem for every fixed k. Now, we have seen that depth-bounded Boolean logics characterize the analytic synthetic distinction in terms of the opposition between actual and virtual information. Now, depth-bounded first-order logics extend this approach to the first order and it adds to this characterization a further element. This element is proper of the quantificational reasoning and has been pointed out by Intica, and it is the need to introduce or not new individuals into the discussion. To be more clear, the extended definition, an inference uh, says that an inference in first order logic is analytic if and only if one, it does not use any piece of virtual information, and we already know what virtual information is and two, it does not introduce new individuals into the argument, and this second point is the proper quantificational part of the definition. And this inference is synthetic otherwise. So, to grasp the quantificational notion of syntheticity without entering into technicalities, consider the following example of a synthetic inference, which is a simplified version of the case first presented in Boulos. So, here, the first premise says that whenever two points are connected through a red arrow, then there exists a third point, which is interpolated through green arrows. Premise 2 says something similar. It says that whenever two points are connected through a green arrow, then there is a third point, which is interpolated through blue arrows. Then, premise 3 says that whenever two points are connected through a blue arrow and the former is colored, then also the latter is colored. And similarly, the conclusion says that whenever two points are connected through a red arrow and the former is colored, then also the latter is colored. So, what is the reasoning that leads us from the premises to the conclusion and why is it synthetic according to this new definition of uh, depth-bounded first-order logics? Well, we could start from premise one and say that whenever two points A and B are connected through a red arrow, then there exists a third point, call it C, which is interpolated through green arrows. Then we could use premise two and reason as follows. Since A and C are connected through a green arrow, then there is, there is another individual, call it D, which is linked to A and C through blue arrows. Similarly, since also C and B are connected through a print arrow, then there is a fifth point E, which is linked to C and B by blue arrows. Then, given premise P3, if A is colored, then also D is colored, because they are connected through a blue arrow. For the same reason, and given that D is colored, then also C is colored. And again, uh, since C is colored, then also E is colored, and since E is colored, then also B is colored. We have reached the conclusion that said that whenever two points are connected through a red arrow and the former is colored, then also the latter is colored. So why is this argument synthetic? Well, it is synthetic because some of its intermediate steps introduce new individuals into the argument, in this case D and E, which do not enter the configuration of the premises, which are much, much more simple than the intermediate step. And these individuals are, at the same time, essential to obtain the conclusion. So, at this point, we might reach the conclusion of this video. And we might say that depth-bounded Boolean logics and their extension to the first-order case vindicate against the logical empiricist movement the idea that not, not all inferences of classical logic are analytic and tautological. On the contrary, most of them are synthetic in the sense that either make, they make essential use of virtual information or they need to introduce new individuals into the discussion. So, um, many thanks to the organizers for their invitations and to you all for your attention. Thank you.